So hello everybody and I'm Katie Green here from Centred Excellence. I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with Ian Woodthorpe, owner of GAP, specialist global talent solutions provider. And GAP have come on a truly incredible journey in the last 18 months where they've doubled their turnover more than once, uh, closed their London operation, relocated to Ireland, restructured their recruitment model and service offering, um, even gone as far as to change their language with their customers. So safe to say that the business operates very differently to where it was just 18 months ago. And Ian and um, his partner, Tony, have achieved, I would probably say, uh, fair to say, what every recruitment business owner dreams of, which is a self-managing, highly efficient recruitment machine that fulfills um, huge retained strategies and projects for blue chip clients across the globe. So I am truly grateful, thank you so much Adam, Ian, for agreeing to be here with me today to share in the secrets, and that's what you're gonna be getting on this call, is to share in the secrets on exactly how Ian and Tony have managed to achieve such amazing and impressive transformational results in the last 18 months. So massive welcome, Ian. Um, welcome to, to today's um, session. Thank you, so, Katie. Uh, it sounds, sounds, I mean, it sounds brilliant. I, uh, you know, <laughs> say it again. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so thank you. I'm honored to be on here. And, and the irony is, I'd actually said to you, we've had such a big transformation in our business. You should use us as a case study. And here we yeah. are. So, oh, there you are. To join me. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much because I know it's time out of your very precious day. So, okay, so let's get stuck in. So the first thing that I thought people would love to hear about, Ian, is actually, right, where was the business, you know, 18 months ago? Um, tell us what was going on and, and, and what was happening in the business then versus, like, where it is now. I think the, the, the business 18 months ago, I was, Tony and I were extremely hands-on. We were very involved. We kind of felt that it was our baby. We were the best at everyone, at, at all the tasks. So we were trying to defragment it as much as possible. I kind of almost describe it on hindsight, almost like as a big ball of string. And the ball was actually growing every year, but it was quite difficult to thread sort of one part of the ball to the other. And mm -hmm. Tony and I were often doing things together that we didn't necessarily have to do. So I would probably, I'd probably say, describe it as an unscalable, uh, unscalable but happy and successful business we were we you know we, we we were winning new business we were we were doing all the right things we were trying to differentiate but we didn't really have a clear it, it wasn't it, the processes and procedures weren't nearly as clear as they should have been and Tony and I were getting involved at all stages of the process which then was normal to us until we actually started mapping out the processes and realized that there actually is a far more efficient way to do it so now, now well, we'll touch on the now later, but where we were there, I would, it, was, it, was, it was a working, happy, big ball of string. It was difficult to, to see where the start to end of it was, in essence. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you were facing? What were the, you know, the sort of problems, day-to-day -day problems that were coming up for you? One as a business owner and, and you know, also in terms of the performance of, of the business. The, I suppose the biggest issue that was coming up with Tony and I was just that feeling that we had to do it all and that it was a, a lot of the business winning, a lot of the client facing stuff. We just, we, we, we felt like we, the onus was on us the whole time to actually go and drive mm -hmm. the business forward, et cetera, and actually be quite hands on in that regard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there was this constant sort of concern as to who we're going to hand off to and almost like a slight reticence to, it, it was sort of chicken and egg. We were so busy doing the stuff that we were a little bit nervous to hand any of it or give a lot of responsibility to other people. In our minds, we didn't want to be micromanagers or handle it all on our own. But it's just an inevitable consequence when you start a business that you, you know, you take responsibility for, for all parts of it. And that's kind of a lot of the fun initially and not having to just, you know, it's the variety and it's the sense of achievement of all the small things when you're small to collect a big debt or you know, to go to a meeting and win something and then find and close out a deal and doing all those things. But it, 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 later on, it's difficult to scale if that's your mindset. And uh, we only realize that on hindsight. You just start doing more of it and trying to fragment some of the processes. So 
that, that I suppose that the constant challenge was just feeling responsible for everything all the time. Um, yeah. And and that that's what's changed now. We respond. We feel more responsible for certain parts of the business, but we realize we aren't responsible for all of it. Great. And um, so you had you know some challenges around the scaling, around retaining people, around you know just in terms of um, of how that operation was working for you in London. And that's that's another interesting point, isn't it? Because at that point you were actually based in London. Yes. So, well, it's, as, a, as, a, as a background, we do do uh, international relocation recruitment. So by our very nature, we have more than one office, but small numbers of people in different parts of the world. So it makes more of a challenge. So we've got people in South Africa, Ireland, and the UK. So that, that brought its own challenges in itself. But also, on hindsight, we needed much clearer processes and procedures in order to yeah. run an efficient business. And I suppose the biggest thing in the past is we were looking for 360 recruiters and were just happening upon people. Some worked out, some didn't. We often would work out, we'd, we'd get an idea of what someone was good at in our minds and kind of keep giving them that same amount of, of, of work and not actually think, could they be doing something else? How can we upskill them to something else? We just kind of labeled that that's what they're capable of and that's what they'll do. Um, and so I suppose that the, for the people in the business, there are limited growth opportunities. There was no real runway or any career progression that they could see. And while all of the stuff's, you know, sort of 101 to a listed big company, to go from small business to medium-sized business or scalable business, even if you stay at 10 people, you know that you could actually replicate the same 10 business in five different locations. That I think is is the biggest challenge. Yeah. So your model at that point, you were three hundred and sixty, as you mentioned. Um, how many projects were you working then? Well, the, we, we were working one project a year, so we had one retained client that we were doing a project with, and that was kind of like the mainstay of the business. Occasionally, they go that that would be two projects from the one from the one uh, client in a year. And the rest of the business, what, how was that made up in terms of that was what, contingent recruitment? Yes. So at the time, the, the rest, that was, it was contingent, non-exclusive, uh, ones and twos here and there. Um, basically, wherever we had a relationship where we thought that we could make some money, we thought, why not, um, within more or less our, our sector? <laughs> so, you know, why would you turn it down when you could potentially build something? So, right. I mean, it's, it's not now that we don't care, but now we are a lot more focused and that has been a game changer for us. And, and, and a lot of that we learned on the program, the avatar client, your avatar candidate, all those sorts of learnings. So you actually start spending, there's only so many hours in a day and you actually start spending your time and energy on, on a specific goal and a specific target client. And even to this day, we do get call-ins and roles that come on that we, 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 we struggle to turn down, but we actually put into a separate team called an ad hoc team. But we are consciously aware that it is out of flow for us and there's a different mentality within that area. Whereas before, we were just taking on bits and bobs. We'd run a project on the same mindset as contingent recruitment. So we've just learned to defragment the whole thing, take a step back, put in process and procedures. So it's, it's completely changed everything that we did. And it's almost, it's kind of like, it, it is like a ball of strength because... If you if a ball of string, when you unravel it, is still a ball of string, but it suddenly makes so much sense. It's coherent. You can cut little bits of it. You can make a long bit or a short bit. Whereas when it's all tied up and you want a long piece, you've got to thread it through and look around the other side. But it's essentially a ball. Of, I, I don't know. That's how I visualize it. It's, it hasn't changed. It's just you look at it in a different way. You structure it in a different way. You package it in a different way, and it just it just makes sense. You can't believe that you were that just just like a ball processes that with no start or end right and that's so good for people to recognize isn't it because that's half of i think the challenge where you know recruitment businesses are recruitment business owners are are the head is which is like you're saying it's almost like that like, i can't say no to anything because if i do that i'm surely i'm turning business away so i've got these clients they want me to work certain briefs so i'm you know i'm taking on reactively what's coming in and I almost don't have enough time for me to think about strategically, well, you know, what would I want to focus on if I could? So 
how is it that I get to that point where I can pinpoint those right roles? And I think that's part of the challenge, isn't it, for people when you're at that point in time? Yeah, I think I, I think we we were we the the we had a few inflection points. I had my top biller at the time had been with me for ten years. It built up a good client base on non-avatar or perfect clients, and when he left and he actually set up his own consultancy, um, that at the time was it it. it it came at the same time as we were working out that the, the clients that he was servicing were actually not what we wanted to go after in terms of our core business. And it came as a big relief that we could actually just defragment ourselves away from the emotional side of letting that business go and actually focus on our core offering. And at the time, it was terrifying. Um, it, was, it, was, it, did, it did take a deep breath in. And I've had a few bits of luck along the way as well because when you, when you luck in terms of the timing – uh, so my business partner, Tony, who's Irish, uh, we set up an office when he moved back to Ireland. Um, and that helped me to get away from the day to day as well. So it, I've, I've had these sort of epiphany moments along the way that's helped me to realize these things, sometimes almost just through chance. But it's, it, it's, it's not saying that detracting from the program, it's enabled me to actually realize you can relax. We have processes in place and we have all the structures needed and it's been a complete it's completely changed i'm completely re-engaged with the business there was a time about five years ago where it was becoming same old same old you run a business for a long time you deal with the same clients and you you can get by but i just you know you can have a good life but you not yeah. i want to create something that's scalable and you know, it's not that we're a massive business, but we, we, we have had a very big year this year and we've been able to scale at very short notice to accommodate that. And in the past, it was kind of like a sardine run. If the sardines come in the bay and you've only got three buckets, that's what you're going to collect. Whereas a process and a model, you can actually just wade in and take everything, as a lot more out because our sales yeah. cycles go up and down. So... So, okay, so let's take people back to, because the journey has, has really been, hasn't it, the last 18 months, I think, when we worked out time frames, wasn't it? It was 18 months that, that you know, we've been working together. So what was the first step that you took that, that set that kind of core foundation? Because I think that's, that's quite an important one to, to share, isn't it? What was that first step for you around, you know, getting it realigned on, on that business and, and and the vision and the values, et cetera? Well, I suppose there's, there were two things, even to take a step back from that. Um, you yeah. start to realize how do you, how do you actually upskill or learn in your industry? If you are, you know, you've got a family at home you, or you might have interests. If you don't have a family, you've got a life to lead and you've got a business to run. So how do you actually up, upskill yourself? So we took two, we, we did actually appoint a non-exec director, someone who came in every quarter. They were very knowledgeable in the industry. We got on very well with them. And what we found is that there was no accountability there. So we'd just end up spending a day uh, talking about various issues, It'd spend an hour and hour one-on-one -on -one with some of the key people in the business. Mm -hmm. And the business was probably six to eight people at that stage. And we actually realized after a year, we're not getting anything out of this. We're not being held to account. We're not moving forward. It's more just a sort of therapy type of learning experience. So then we embarked on, on your group course where mm. we actually realized that, that our business is quite far ahead compared to other businesses. And it gave us an opportunity to compare ourselves and, and actually realize, actually, we do, we, we, we do have a big ball there, but it is still a ball. And then after that, when we started engaging more in the, in the personalized program with yourself uh, and Nikki. And that was probably the, the eureka moment where we actually started working out sort of how, how, what is the blueprint for, for this house? What are the foundations? What are the walls? What do you want the rooms to look like? And it was a far more, it, we actually took a step back and realized, you know, what should we be doing here? And you do need to be engaged in, in the process. And, so the first thing that we did was we took your advice to map what our values are of the business because mm -hmm. we actually did have some values on the wall which I kind of made up on the hoof, had them printed, and no, they hung above everyone's head. And no one for – you could offer a million pounds to people that wouldn't know what they were. And nothing was around them. Then, and values just seemed a little bit nebulous to us. But on your mm -hmm. advice, the epiphany well, – well, the start was when we actually brainstormed exactly the process that you taught me. 
um, because I tended to have a far more autocratic leader style. Uh, this is how we're going to do it. That kind of, without without wanting to think that I'm, it's a one way conversation. I thought people would be buying in, but it wasn't actually as one way as I thought it would be. And you you helped me teach. You taught me the pro process to actually map out our values. And once we had our values, which are professional, ambitious, and committed, which everyone had bought into, we then started mapping all our processes, our language, our everything around those values, and we reiterate them the whole time. And in fact, this morning I had an onboarding call with two new starters, and that's exactly the first words I told them were about our values, what they mean, how they demonstrated, what professional means in terms of how we speak to each other, in terms of how the, the experience that candidates will have with us. And that was the first part, and that, that was the messaging, and everything basically built around those three things. Now all our processes, our, how, we, how we analyze people, how we promote people, is all measured against those values. And that gave us a good starting point to actually work out, you know, why, what, what does that mean and how does it manifest itself? And now we use that language all the time. And I know a lot of companies do map the values, but they don't then learn to put their processes and their metrics around it, which is something you taught us. So a lot of what you helped me to understand and get a clearer picture of was I, I kind of like had it in a swirl, but this actually created a good process. You could hang it on. It's, it's like the puzzle pieces sort of fell together. That, that, so that was the starting point in a long-winded way. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And, and you're right because, you know, so many companies do. They, they take that time, they're investing, creating great values, um, and yet it's almost like they're sort of hanging um, and they haven't really been fully utilised all the way through the structure of the communication piece around customers and internally and externally, you know, our stakeholders, but how we're actually really living and breathing those values um, and how that really then comes to life. It makes your whole service offering come to life, doesn't it? So um, so thank you. That That's great in terms of that. And then, so you, you did that part. And then what would be, what would you say was kind of the next, you know, critical or pivotal step that you took that, had a big impact. I think what initially on the program, what I found is that it was it, you started thinking again. So it actually took it took a it took a good year, not necessarily. It took a year of going to the course every two months to actually start actually, actually removing yourself and kind of getting a drone view and starting to think how do other businesses do it? How would we do it in an ideal world? Just getting that thought process going because. It's a long time since you study or you think analytically about these things because you're doing stuff and you, you just sort of make marginal gains. So, so the mm -hmm. next part after that was actually in one of our brainstorming sessions where you were writing on the board what our processes were and whatnot. And at that point, we actually realized that, that, that the, the, the type of string that this whole ball is is quite different and could be marketed in a different way. And mm -hmm. we, none of us had actually realized that. So I think... But the, the main point, I think, is that I, for business owners out there, whatever sector they're in, and we, we have a slightly different model in that we do international relocation sites, we have far more uh, in-depth screening, and we have aftercare teams, we have longer processes. So it was probably quite a new model to you, and, but the, and there might be other business owners who have different, different models or, or contract models or whatever, but I think that the... The, by defragmenting and actually looking at them, you can actually start looking at it differently, marketing it differently. And that was at that moment when we thought, actually, we should be going for project type of roles. We should be marketing ourselves as that. We should base all our processes around that. That was probably the moment where we thought, actually, that is that that, that was almost like a eureka moment. And whether we can actually ever achieve a full project, we thought we we're going to start doing volume recruitment even if they're going to interview four people in an afternoon, right. and that's what we're going to go for. So that was probably the biggest, the biggest moment. And that came just through opening your mind and actually defragmenting and brainstorming. And I think we were away on that retreat for two days for that. That came on the second morning. So yeah. I think it was the detailed delving in and defragmentation that actually got us to that point. And I don't think we'd ever have invested that sort of time to think like that on our own, even if we had a whole day off-site. We would get yeah. distracted by, you know, a, a person and, and their issues or one of our top consultants or something like that. It would just, it would just would never have happened. Yeah, yeah, there is real value, isn't there, in lifting yourself out of the business and actually 
being in a different environment as well as a different headspace when you're doing that kind of work, you know, thinking about what, where's the business going and really getting under the bonnet of what's going on. Yeah. So, uh, so let's talk about how that then sort of made that shift because you're right. So you, the processes you went through, you got clear on those. And then how did we, you know, how did you create that service offering and then take that to market? Because that's pretty well, I think once you start actually realizing that the string does need to be laid out in a more coherent format and you actually start unraveling the pieces, then then you start to actually work out what is our model going to look like. And a lot of your guidance helped in terms of the, the way forward, the 360 is becoming less and less prevalent simply because it's a hard skill set to find. And a lot of the, the you, you opened our eyes to the talent dynamics test that you help with where people, you, you measure people for what they're good at you put them in roles that they're good at. And that, that was also a, a, a big moment for us because we started to actually think differently and realize that, that a lot of our people had just kind of drifted from one role into another, into another. There was no clear, coherent game plan. And mm -hmm. sometimes they were in, in what they were doing, they were good at some things, but not good at others. And th this way we could actually work out what are they best at and let's focus them on that. And what are we best at and let's focus on that. And probably the, the, the first step uh, to be more specific was when we brainstormed onto the 180 model. So yeah. we moved away from the 360 model. And from there we started actually working out, okay, where's this process gonna start and end? What are the skill sets you're gonna need for that? Where are they gonna grow to? How are you going to measure them? How are you going to check how, on the way in? And that actually drove us to start being far more selective about, and our, about our process, bringing people into the business. And it is totally ironic that I'm married to a doctor and the lot, they have to beg to go and get antibiotics. And it's, it's, uh, I think it's the same when you're in a recruitment business. You just It's kind of getting people on. You just think, oh, you, you do it on gut feel, on likability, on mini-me's, on all sorts of prejudice. And it just, yeah. it, it, it's, it's inevitable in this way. We actually learned, okay, what is the skill set? What exactly do you need to do? What is the role? Where is it going to grow to? What levels are they going to come in at? And that, to us, just made life a lot easier. And it's easier to recruit. It's easier to start working out who should be doing what. And it, it, helped, it helped. It also gave a sense of reassurance to Tony and I that we shouldn't be doing that role without wanting to be high and mighty. That is, a talent manager does that. A relationship manager does this. A project manager does this. And we do this. We're responsible for our own set of different things and it also drove accountability amongst us and that that to me was also quite it it it, it was a sort of a breath of fresh air and um I, so i think i think that that to me if I, I think if people are just looking for a passive way to grow their business they you know they can feel better about doing online course or maybe a motivational thing will rile them up but in terms of the actual someone to hold to actually show teach processes to help drive it and and, and actually teach them ways to actually fish so that you can actually help feed the business. That's what I've learned a lot from, from your course and, and from you in particular. So I'm, I can only, I, I always said, Katie, I, I'm, I'm very complimentary. I'm, I'm not trying to, and I remember you showing, sorry, I, I know it's a bit informal, but I remember you showing us uh, on the first, uh, uh, some of the, the case studies and the stories and, yeah. On the first day, you're never quite sure. No, I'm not quite sure if they did double their turnover or you're not. I'm, you, you, there's always a slight skepticism, I suppose. But now it's it's just a bit surreal to be in you know here on this yeah. journey. and we've still got a lot to learn. It's not perfect, but we know exactly what we need to do, and you work on it every day. Yeah, and that's it, isn't it? And that's a really good point, actually. Not not to sort of you know digress from where we are, but you're right, which is it's that consistency isn't it because it's that discipline of consistency as a business owner that you you can never stop so the learning never stops the the focus never stops um because you know everything is always evolving and moving forward and you, you know you don't want to get complacent or think that okay well maybe i've done enough now because unless you're constantly moving then you're behind the times aren't you oh absolutely and also it's, it is reinvigorating to actually go and work you know the, i've always heard this concept work on the business like instead of in the business and i never quite understood it i thought does that mean you kind of retire is that when you sell the business and and actually from my experience i actually do have free time to actually 
draw processes and see ideally where we should be. And my my skill set is or my profile is creative. So that's when I'm I'm thinking of ideas and working them out. Now we've actually worked out, okay, someone creates ideas, someone sells the ideas, someone delivers the ideas, someone picks up the pieces, someone, so everyone has their own kind of the, the, the role that they're perfect for and they're in flow on and we all share in the same values. So so that that's what I, I, I learned. I, I suppose it's almost like if you don't have clear processes and you understand exactly where they start and finish and the different roles and it's clear in your mind and you can and recruit people without you having to speak to them because you actually have clear processes and they know that's their role. Then until that point, you kind of touch on probably a lot of the processes. So it might be that you might talk to one of your key clients. Then you may close out one of the top, uh, one, you know, a, a senior hire. Uh, then you may help manage one of the talent managers. So you're doing so many different things. It's virtually impossible to kind of extract yourself from the process because you are so integral to it, even at little inflection points and what I've found is that it empowers your team when they know that's my responsibility and I'm, I'm it, it used to be up to Tony and I to say okay we're going to be in on Monday we're going to do this time and that and now we use a, a collaborative tool called Teams and I see my relationship managers saying guys we're doing a kickoff meeting for this project at eight in the morning completely off their own bat because they are empowered to actually go that's my role that's my we've never had that in the past and it's just it just just saying that's where you start and finish it empowers them because we were surprised at how people when you're touching in the process they actually think well I, I should kind of be a bit hands off on that and because right. you know that's Ian that's what Ian does and we're thinking I do it because you're not stepping up to the plate to do it it's all that's miscommunication awesome. that's what I've found and it's completely everyone just knows exactly where they stand and it's it's just empowered us. Oh. And what's helped you to get that? What you know, in terms of get getting to that point, what specifically have you implemented or, or put into place that's done that's done that for you? I think that the the things that we we we've been quite we we whatever we've decided we're going to implement, we've stuck to. So we probably a big game changer for us was appointing a, a very strong operations manager, and what she does is help. A lot of the, it makes sure that there's consistency of processes because I don't I've I've found that we had some amazing ideas. Or you you go to you meet someone and they said this is how we're doing our processes and and you actually learn along the way and different new LinkedIn techniques, but they weren't consistently applied. So the operation manager, what we found is once we actually said okay, these, these are the this is the role profiles, this mm -hmm. is the, the the type of personality who will do well in that role, and we are disciplined about getting people in the business. And we were disciplined about sticking to those role profiles and 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 giving them a staircase where you can move to this role or to that role to that role. And that mm. that to me was probably you know, one one of the big things for us is actually so consistency, consistency of the message and uh, and investing the time and actually getting the, the getting the information because you often actually know. Well, I, I can explain to someone in the morning what their role should be and how to do it, but mm. it's, it, people learn in different ways as. As you've illustrated to us, some people are visual, some are like to hear it or auditory. So there are a lot of different ways. We just assume that they're going to learn in the way that we teach them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, so, and then with the, um, what about, let's talk about the, your centers of excellence and, um, you know, the, the, um, sort of upskilling you've been doing of the staff as well and the role functions, but also how you've created these um, centers where you've got the right people in the right places that fit within that model. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, one of the, what, in, while we were unraveling the piece of string, we were surprised at how long our, pro, how, how our process has a lot more of the initial screening and a lot more of the aftercare. And we were actually surprised when we mapped out the different skills needed for at each parts of the of, of the process and the, the candidate's journey. Um, mm -hmm. That and and the different that, that we could actually defragment it and get people working more efficiently within the things that they're good at, as opposed to expecting some people to find the talent, some people to engage the talent, some people to sell to the talent, some people to help overcome their fears, some people all those sorts of processes. So I suppose once you, once you actually know, okay, 
this is this is how the process works. You can defragment it. You can find the right people for that, and you can tell them you can move from this part of the process to that part of the process, and you start it, you start actually creating an automatic staircase, and mm -hmm. you you start thinking people feel empowered to do what you, the the bits of that 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 they feel responsible for. So it, it's engendered a sense of responsibility and ownership that I didn't envisage, and I didn't think would be as it, 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 it has changed things a lot. Yeah. So <clears throat> the models can change the... Um, tell us a bit about the language, actually, because that's really interesting as well in terms of how you mirror your clients. The language was, was also... The, the language is something we, we are working hard on, and it's actually great. So it's a differentiator. So we came to a conclusion in one of our brainstorming sessions, as you remember, that we actually do do things differently. And we... We were, you, you posed the question to us, if you are a me too model, you're just, it's just, you're going to be beaten on price. So how do you, how, how do you actually mark yourself as an us only model? And the us only model, we were doing quite different uh, process anyway, but we weren't telling or marketing people that, that we were doing it that way. So it was almost kind of like a, it's like flying from one airport to the other. We were all getting to the same place, us and our competitors, but they were flying them on Ryanair and we were bringing them on a private jet. So we weren't emphasizing just how, how much of a better journey they'd have with us. And, and right. so you helped with that and saying, actually, you know, when, when people board your plane, you don't say to them, uh, do you want a window seat? You might use the language of, would you like a panoramic view? Or, so that's just like a sort of off the cuff random thing. So we started using language of talent partner and talent professional. So talent partner in the old language is a client, a talent professional is a candidate. And the, the, we refer to that the whole time. And people, and the aim was when people meet with anyone in our business, they're going to think they sound different, they look a bit different, they, they, their model's a bit different, they are a bit different. And everyone wants to be a bit different or differentiate. And using the language, is, has helped us and internally as well. We're the only business that uses that um, co compared to our competitors, and it just it it helps it, it just helps make people think hmm, they do sound a bit different. They they are a bit different, and it just highlights that. And that to us is actually and and Anna, who is our operations manager, is brilliant at that, and she does drive that language a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it does. Everyone feels quite proud to actually have a unique um, yeah. you know, differentiator. And they're really important, aren't they? Particularly in the, you know, in the way that recruitment is progressing, you have got to be different. You've got to be stand out from the crowd, haven't you, to get in front of those clients. And certainly I think it, it's made a difference for you guys because you were up against very tough competition, weren't you, in your market? Yeah, our market's dominated by very big in-house teams because we deal with people-only businesses that are very asset light. So it's just literally service businesses. So they, they, it's worth their while to set up big recruitment teams. So we had to find a differentiator, and you have to illustrate that differentiator. And uh, the experience that people have with the brand is completely different uh, if you are an integrated unit, whereas a lot of the bigger companies, you'll have one area that sources people, one that does the initial screening. None of them are, are joined up thinking. And the actual experience for the talent, which and then there is a war on talent in certain of these, of, of, in a lot of the professional services firms, so you need to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. And if you understand how to market your business, it's often your, your clients will actually be thinking, actually, I never thought of that. I never thought of the experience they're having and the brand awareness and what they're going to be left with. And that's something that a lot of smaller businesses can actually market because these are 15,000 person businesses. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Um, just in terms of how you know how you went about doing that, because I know you know Tony's not on the call with us today. He's hopefully sunning himself somewhere really nice. <laughs> um, but you know, he he is you and him are you know a real duo in the sense of when you know we first started working together, you were very much as you say in the business, and you guys weren't out doing that client facing piece which in fact is where you are both so incredibly just like phenomenal brilliant at and um actually at what point did that enable you guys to get out because that's when business really started flying wasn't it yeah i think certainly from i mean tony is he's phenomenal on the the he's able to position our proposition brilliantly to people he's excellent on the sales side and people do buy into him 
the, what it was holding us back is that Tony would sell a project and he'd actually had a fear of delivery. And you're only as good as your last project. You can't go and promise the world because then we actually, we're accountable at the end. We don't just hand it over. People say, hey, you, you promised this and that's what we got. So he had a fear of overselling. But with the processes in place, and he knew that, that he, he got a lot more comfort and felt a lot more secure going to sell other roles because that was his greatest fear. And from my side, I felt a lot more comfort knowing that everyone is in flow and that I'm thinking, what are the trends in the next six months? I'm thinking six months ahead. I have time to actually focus on that. You know, can we be positioning this into more of a, a closer offering, possibly a sort of a, 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 an RPO light type model with that particular talent partner? Those sorts of thinking, whereas before you didn't have time to do that. And Tony just has the time to work out, okay, which are the key clients, where are opportunities lie? And people are, it, it, it's just, it just, there's not less to worry about. And I think that your, I, don't, I think your brain only has a capacity to kind of think a certain number of thoughts. And if you are worried about, is that invoice being collected? I wonder if that was done or this done. And you don't have the security of a process and you know that that's being followed through consistently. It doesn't mean that balls aren't going to get dropped along the line, but it does mean there's a process where if something isn't done, uh, a manager will pick it up. It'll get actioned over here and you probably won't even hear about it, but it gets addressed. And before you would have heard and thought, how do we fix that and get involved? And it just, it just... Is there are only and, and even if it just throws your thought pattern for ten minutes, it's gonna it, it does affect your day. And mm. it is gonna add up. All small bits are gonna add up. So that that's what's changed us. We're all in flow, we have confidence in the delivery and it kind of has made it everyone just can take a breath in really. And what so let's talk about it. What difference does that make? How many projects are you working now? What what's the trump what's the shift? Well, the the the, mark, the sales cycle is up. So in I have to say that there is a short the, the, there is a, a, a big demand for the services we provide, which is brilliant. But the so in, in terms of the shift, it's massive. We've gone from doing one one or two projects a year with one client to doing we've got four clients doing two or three projects a year. And uh, there's there's untapped territories, untapped projects. We've got a game plan next year of which territories we're going to go and get to. So mm -hmm. it is a combination of the, the market is up, but because we ha we have the ability to scale at short notice, we are able to take to to take advantage of those. And I have in years past seen hot markets come and go, and have, you know just not have more hands to collect more sardines, and that's been a big frustration. So. Yes, in terms of, I would, I would credit the, the, the market has had some element, but our turnover has more than doubled, and it's it gone up 50% conservatively prior to that, and then doubled on that. And some of that's the market, but uh, the, a lot of it is the processes, because if, if the market slows now, we actually have a process to work out where our opportunities lie, and I'm, I'm confident we'll go and sell into other territories or other areas. So we'll right. just refocus our energies onto that. So I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually not worried if the market in our particular sector goes down, whereas I'd be constantly anxious about that. And if, this, if the market keeps coming up, we, we've got a process to actually easily scale that up and, and just basically replicate what we have. So it, that is a big relief because I've, I've, I've always wondered, how do you get that? Where do you start? How do you replicate that? But it is just a process. Just, just so it, it starts with unwinding the string. And unwinding the string starts with actually thinking about it for a year of which getting your mind into the unravel mode. That's my experience. I mean. So, yeah, what would be your top tips then? What do you think are the three most important elements or areas for people to be considering? In, just in terms of the actual doables or in terms of how we got to this position? Yeah, just just how what were the key things, the three sort of major things that you think if if I'm a recruiting business owner, I want to grow my business. I'm listening to Ian. I'm like, that sounds amazing. I, I would like to achieve what he's achieved. And as you and I both know, it's it, it's that it's there for anybody, isn't it? So what would you say are the three areas that they need to consider? I would say the first area is do they look in the mirror and actually go, do you want a lifestyle business? Do, do you want to actually, do, do you want to grow the business genuinely? And then the second part I'd say is, I think they actually have to realize that 
they are going to have to take a breath in and they are going to have to commit some time away from the business and that will cause that will be cause anxiety initially and uh, and I think what the third part I'd say is when you actually know what you need to do you need to have the discipline to do it but having said that it's not that I'd, I'd, I wasn't working till midnight every night and weekends to try and implement the plan I do think that there, there was plenty of time to do it I could just set aside an hour here and there so it's not it wasn't a huge commitment time-wise, but it is a commitment that unless you're following through on the things, and it's small steps at a time. So, you know, just if, if, if you want to map your values, you actually in the next month need to get everyone together, get your whiteboard up, and actually start doing it. So it's small, small things taken consistently over time. Those are what, so that, that would be my advice. Don't kind of think, oh, it's going to take ages to get there or there's a quick fix. It's a process to go through, and I've probably... The first bit was actually the time commitment. And I remember having that conversation with Tony and then he was thinking, you know, it's going to be six days out the business and we're there and oh, yeah, it's six for you, six for me. And that, that, that was a big disincentive to us. And uh, on hindsight, it, 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 you, you need that commitment. You need to be away from the business to actually, you know, get a good bird's eye view. So those are the three kind of, I suppose, the main things, all at the start of the journey. Just like, and then from there, it just, things just fall into place. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's true. So where would you say, I mean, from your um, position, looking at, you know, recruitment as an industry, what do you also, what do you think is important for recruitment business owners to be thinking about over the next 12 months? Because there's so much going on, isn't there, in terms of, you know, things in, in, in the marketplace, things that may or may not, let's say, come, come to light. What, what would you say, that you know they need to be considering in light of what what the future could hold. I I think more and more firms are able to access the talent or know who's out there and map the talent in the market. And a lot of them are doing. I think the biggest threat is internal recruitment teams doing things badly because they they don't have the recruitment DNA. Uh, they often are that they, they, they just. I think that. Being, as a recruitment owner, you need to work out what value are you going to add and how can you demonstrate that value to your clients? Because I think if you, if, if the, the old model, being able to access talent is, is probably going to die out and they're going to start thinking about their brand, their brand awareness in the market, the inflection points. Uh, and people are giving feedback now on Glassdoor about the processes and how they felt afterwards. And I think firms are starting to wake up to the fact that the, the, the very few will end up with positions in their in their companies, but many will go through the process. And it's the journey and the experience that, that many have that's actually going to set them apart in the future when there's a war for talent. And even Ryanair is starting to realize you actually can't treat people like dirt anymore, even though volume isn't going to work. And I think that that's probably what I've learned. You've got to differentiate and see what are they not... What can we either do better that the internal teams are doing or what can we do slightly differently and right. market that? And we've got so many unique selling points as smaller businesses where the owners are invested in the process from start to finish. We, you know, they, 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 they know that you care and, and, and that, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of their, their, their service delivery lines that are giving them people internally don't really care. And uh, there's a lot you can differentiate. And, and would you would it be fair to say, because I think you've highlighted this, that there are, you know, when you think about recruitment businesses, it doesn't matter what size, what market you're in, you will have unique abilities. Maybe you're not aware of them right now, but they are there. Um, it's actually about teasing them out, isn't it? About, you know, identifying what is different about what you do and how you do it and then packaging that. Absolutely. It may, I, I think it may even be, something that a lot of people just take for granted. So it might be, you might have, that it hasn't even occurred to them. You might have someone who wants a, a, a niche recruitment business of four people. He, they, it could potentially grow to eight. And the owner doesn't actually realize that the fact that they, you know, might be some specialist engineer or something, so that, and they've got a, a, a pool of people and contacts and people that they know actually gives them a unique ability to engage with those people or they just, Think, take that for granted and or there's small things that they may that they may have that they don't realize they have and when they've got it they don't really know how to position that or make it an offering to their clients and how to go about that and they also might not be 
I think it helps provide clarity on which clients to go for and, you know, and what sectors and just, you know, start defining a strategy. Uh, because I think that does, it provides, a, it provides a lot of guidance to business owners because, you know, there's, in recruitment, you get a lot of opportunities that come your way and might be in the same sector and you've got to have, actually have the discipline to work on, you know, where should I focus my energies on? Mm, mm. Great. Well, thank you so much. You've shared so much. Is there anything you, you want to add before we, we part company with our, our wonderful audience? Anything else you think is really important to share with them in terms of, you know, maybe, you know, just having that courage and and conviction to, to do it? Because so many people, I think, hold back from taking that step, don't they, out of, like you're saying, fear maybe or, or concern about what might happen? Yeah, I suppose on hindsight, it's it's one of those things it was probably just as easy to say oh, we'll we'll do it next year as it was to actually say okay let's actually you know let let let's go and actually give it a go now and I, i've got a friend of mine always has the saying he says when's the last time you went to the gym and regretted it so the hardest step is the first one so that is i suppose in addition if you're busy or you think oh, i don't know if i want to go through this journey and I don't know if I want to take the time out. I suppose it's just that first moment of going, okay, let me go and actually start the journey. And mm -hmm. I suppose it's just like, it, it's, it's like doing a, a, a marathon. It starts with the very first mile and then you just find your rhythm as you go along. So I suppose the thing is, don't be scared by the time up the business because you actually need it. And you'll, it, the, the return on investment is, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it's been huge for us so you know it's 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 all kind of fallen into place and I, I think it's just a process to help fall into place i don't think it's like you provide all the answers it actually often help facilitate that process and help facilitate and coherently put our ideas into sort of one place so yeah basically in a nutshell long than a verb saying first step's the hardest i'm glad we took it <laughs> yeah, good. so am i so am i and so continue to continue to <laughs> Yeah. You're to underestimate what you guys do it's it's incredible and it's i'm very you know very grateful and proud to be a part of your um, part of your team and part of your journey so we yeah we love serving you so well thank you all for listening i'm sure you found that really valuable and thank you again ian for that time that investment we really appreciate it and um, we wish you all the very best of luck as well as you continue your journey and uh, fantastic work. So thanks all for listening and we will see you soon. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Thanks, Katie.